and we're live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this breakout session, which focuses on children with disabilities in the youth justice system. We've about an hour for this session, which will conclude at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Each of our three speakers will present for about 12 minutes, which means we'll have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for your questions and answers. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screen to submit your question to our moderators. If possible, please include your name and the name of the organization you work with alongside your question. And if your question is for one of our speakers in particular, please do let us know who. The Ombudsman for Children's Office is an independent statutory body which was established in 2004 under a piece of law called the Ombudsman for Children Act 2002. As an organization, the Ombudsman for Children's Office, or OCO for short, has engaged with a range of issues regarding child justice and regarding children with disabilities across our two core statutory functions. These functions are to promote the rights and welfare of children and to examine and investigate complaints made by or for children about the administrative actions of public bodies which have or may have adversely affected a child. Obviously, while today's conference focuses on the UNCRPD and specifically on Article 13 of the CRPD, the UN Treaty that is a key reference point for much of our work as an office, including our work in relation to child justice and our work regarding children with disabilities, is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which sets out the rights that all children under 18 are entitled to. As you know, Ireland ratified this convention in 1992. The state's progress in fulfilling its obligations to children and their rights under this convention has been examined by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child on three occasions to date, most recently in 2016. The committee's work to examine Ireland for a fourth time has just started, with the committee compiling a list of issues prior to reporting for Ireland during its recent session earlier this month. Before introducing our first speaker and allowing that the UN human rights standards are not mutually exclusive, Perhaps it's worth noting some key points from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which might usefully inform our thinking about the rights of children with disabilities in the child justice system. Firstly, and fundamentally, the UNCRC tells us that children are subjects of rights, that is, they're rights holders in their own right. Secondly, the Convention sets out four general principles, which are vital to the realisation of children's other rights under the Convention. These principles are children's right to non-discrimination, children's right to have their best interests treated as a primary consideration in all actions concerning them, children's right to life, survival and development, and crucially, children's right to be heard and to have due weight given to their views in accordance with their age and maturity. Thirdly, while all of the UNCRC's articles apply to children with disabilities, Article 23 focuses, focuses specifically on children with disabilities. Among other things, Article 23 underscores that children with disabilities should enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity, promote self-reliance and facilitate their active participation in the community. It also states that children with disabilities have a right to special care and to corresponding assistance designed to ensure that they have effective access to and receive education, training, healthcare services, rehabilitation services, preparation for employment and recreation opportunities, all in a manner conducive to their achieving the fullest possible social integration and individual development. Finally, and with regard to child justice, we can distill a number of key mes messages from articles 37 and 40 and associated general comments from the committee. These messages include that children are different from adults and therefore must be treated differently by and in the justice system. The state must therefore promote the establishment of child specific laws, procedures, authorities and institutions in this regard. Children accused of or recognised as having infringed the criminal law and children deprived of their liberty must be treated with humanity and respect for their inherent dignity and in a proportionate manner which takes into account their age and which is appropriate to their well-being. Detention should only ever be used as a measure of last resort and approaches to child justice should include a focus on prevention early intervention and alternatives to detention. And finally, where detention is necessary, it should be for the shortest appropriate period of time and it should promote and support the child's reintegration into society. With these child rights based points in mind, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Daeglon O'Brien from um, the Department of Justice, where he's a principal officer. And Daeglon, it's very interesting, going to talk to us about the new youth justice strategy and specifically about proposals for a preventative approach. Daeglon, I'll hand over to you, please. 
thank you very much. And straight into my uh, first slide, please. Okay, I'm going to talk about three different things. The Youth Justice Strategy, linked within that um, the Guard Diversion Projects and other community-based services that we put in place for young offenders, <clears throat> excuse me, and then end up talking about the O'Malley Report, which focuses um, on victims of sexual crime and their position in, in, in the criminal justice system, but goes on to take a wider focus in terms of vulnerable victims and witnesses, including defendants more generally. I end up with a bit of information about that. Uh, in terms of the context and looking at children with disabilities, both as victims and as offenders, I have to start by saying there's very little hard information available in Ireland. In terms of um, children with disabilities as offenders, um, we have a very clear socioeconomic context for youth offending. Uh, the factors include early school leaving, being on reduced hours in school. That suggests a general learning difficulties um, for quite a few of the young people who come to the attention of the law. Poverty, and family issues, including addiction and the absence of a positive role model um, are also factors. Um, so what we tend to look at is the position uh, of young people and the picture they present in the round rather than seeking to focus in on specific learning difficulties or other disabilities. Children at risk um, and their families are on continuum right from early childhood to the teenage years to aging out of the system as young adults and the range of needs and risks presented vary uh, quite a bit over that life cycle and that's one of the challenges for us in devising the new youth justice strategy. Next slide please. <clears throat> in our system diversion is the, fault, is the default option children are not prosecuted if there is a credible alternative. And circumstances where there isn't a credible alternative would include where the crime is quite serious or the child is a prolific repeat offender and previous efforts at diversion haven't um, worked. Some numbers for Ireland, population of 4.9 million, 1.2 million children, uh, some 10,000 children offended in 2019 all were considered for the Garda diversion programme. Most were diverted, approximately a thousand prosecuted. And of those, most uh, cases ended with no conviction or probation. And a total of 127 um, young people attained in Overstown. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of the new justice strategy, uh, the intention is this will be a standalone document, but it will fit within the new um, national framework in relation to children and young people, better outcomes, better futures. Uh, we published a draft in June. We're going to go to, this, to government for approval for a revised draft in December, and we're currently running the final um, consultations. Um, two uh, issues to just flag at this stage is uh, there are two uh, commitments in the programme for government in relation to establishing a national um, anti-social behaviour forum and to extending a diversion approach to young adults 18 to 24 and uh, I'll come to that later on. Both of those are being addressed in the youth justice strategy as well. In terms of priorities, evidence for what we do and I flagged that, that we need more research so research is a major priority and coherence in terms of providing wraparound services and having coherent structures to respond to that continuum of needs over the family life cycle, over the child's life uh, that I mentioned earlier. So we're looking at a duty to cooperate and local mechanisms at county and sub-county level to make that uh, a reality. And early supports and interventions are also critically important. And I will come back to that. Uh, uh, later on in slightly more detail. So next slide, please. Other priorities, as I mentioned, extending the diversion approach to 18 to 24 year olds, uh, post-detention supports and the operation and supports that are available to children when in detention, 
some amendments to legislation, but the major priority is on evidence for what we do and practical supports for children and for their families. And again, looking at children and offending as being on a continuum and a pyramid. Uh, and the more deeply a child, young person gets involved in the criminal justice system, the numbers go down, but the human cost and the difficulty resolving that uh, increase. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. Community-based services. Um, what we have here is, is a list of community-based services uh, that we have. Uh, as of last week, they are all the responsibility of the Department of Justice with a transfer of functions from the former Department of Children and Youth Affairs. <clears throat> we have guarded diversion projects, 105 locally based projects, uh, an emphasis in the last two years, which will be reinforced in the youth justice strategy on early intervention working with children who are on a trajectory towards getting into difficulty with the law and family support, looking at the child in the context of the family and in the context of the community. Working with harder to engage young people, and these would be typically young people who are deeply involved in antisocial behaviour, um, but who aren't actively before the courts and for whom very often there is no other service. Uh, probation service, community projects, and the bail supervision scheme, which transferred across from DCYA. The Greentown projects, uh, rolling out two pilots, and they're about looking at how we disrupt the recruitment of children by criminal gangs. And then finally, what's known as the Joint Agency Response to Crime, uh, or WIJARC, which is a response by all the criminal justice agencies in terms of targeting prolific offenders and trying to disrupt that behavior. And, and my question on the other side of the screen is, how do all these things put together as part of a coherent package within the criminal justice system? They're now all uh, the responsibility of the Department of Justice. So there's an opportunity there to look at this as a toolbox and to use the different bits to respond in a flexible way to the needs of particular communities and particular cohorts of young children. And the other question is, how does all this fit together with wider child and family services and specifically mainstream youth services and the child and family services that TUSLA is responsible for. Next slide, please. Coming to the O'Malley report, um, as I said, the focus on in, in the, the motivation for uh, commissioning this report was the position of victims of sexual crime within the criminal justice system, how difficult that is. Uh, the O'Malley recommendations range uh, also include um, measures to support vulnerable victims, witnesses and defendants, and that includes children and it includes adults uh, with disabilities and of course children with disabilities. So a range of things that um, have been recommended in the report. Uh, it was published <coughs> 11 weeks ago. Uh, our minister tasked us in the department with producing an implementation plan within 10 weeks. We managed to do that, that and it'll be published next week. So I can point to some of the things that will be in the implementation plan, but I can't preempt what the minister is going to say, but there'll be a lot more detail available next week. So one really important priority is making information available, um, comprehensive information on everything that a victim um, or any vulnerable person involved in, in, in a criminal justice process would need and making that available in accessible format, reform of legislation, training for Ngarda Siakona and for legal professionals and others uh, so that they understand the communication needs, they understand the, the appropriate style of questioning of people who are vulnerable, um, and that they're aware of the impact of trauma. Um, <clears throat> We are looking at how we support uh, victims and vulnerable defendants uh, within the system at, at three levels. Intermediaries, uh, looking at the journey and looking at what supports the department already funds uh, and provides in partnership with the voluntary uh, sector. I might start, uh, break the order in, in which the three points are listed here by starting with the journey. One of the really important things is, is to look at what the experience of a vulnerable person, a victim or a vulnerable defendant is uh, from the very start of an offence being committed or an arrest being made right through to the very end of the process 
and to see where um, there are gaps in the support or in the information provided, perhaps by virtue of the person, uh, the responsibility being transferred from one agency to another. So we're looking at how we can map that journey, identify the gaps and put something positive in place to support them. And first and foremost, that involves a review of the grants that the Department of Justice provides um, to a range of voluntary organizations, most working in the uh, domestic abuse area um, to provide court accompaniment and other support services uh, for, for victims. Uh, so how do we extend that to vulnerable participants generally? How do we make sure that the supports are available uh, to a high standard throughout the state in a context in which what we do um, has grown up organically and is a response largely to applications for funding that we get from voluntary organizations. So consistency, standards, training and universal access, really important. We've set us as a target of, of reviewing our grant scheme um, and, and dealing with all those issues and producing a plan to deal with all those issues by the end of the year. And the Minister will be announcing uh, more details. And then finally, intermediaries. And there's a distinction that is important for me to stress between the supports that we provide um, to the victim, to the participant, in terms of having somebody there who understands the system and who can explain uh, what's going to happen next and knows where information uh, is available and can act as a link uh, between the vulnerable person and um, the other participants, the guards, the legal teams and so on, on the one hand, and the concept of an intermediary on the other. So these are two distinct things. The supports we provide uh, in terms of grants, which we will review, are supports for the person. The concept of an intermediary actually exists in our legislation since 1992, although it hasn't been really activated to any great extent. Uh, and and, and the, the basic idea is that an, an intermediary isn't there um, in theory to support uh, the victim or the other participant, although what they do is usually supportive. They're there to assess the person's communications needs um, and to act as almost uh, as an interpreter uh, between the, the person and the, the court, the legal teams and Garda Siakana, um, so that questioning can be relayed in a way that's accessible to a person who has communications difficulties or an intellectual or, or learning disability. Um, we're looking at putting in place a plan to deliver on, on the commitment in the O'Malley report to have a service for intermediaries up and running very early next year. There's a number of elements to it. One is about recruitment and maintaining a register. Uh, another is about training and looking how we might partner with uh, an academic institution to provide uh, training and accreditation. Uh, and, and second, uh, next, there's a question about um, uh, maintaining a formal register, which might link into CORU, the body that regulates uh, social care professions, and also may have a role for, for the courts. And just to conclude, one of our key partners in this extra work, which will commence very quickly once the O'Malley report implementation plan is published, will be the National Disability Authority who have provided a very useful paper that fed into our thinking on this, on um, intermediaries for people with disabilities. So I'll conclude on that point and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daglon, and for keeping to time. That was a very comprehensive um, presentation in a short period of time. And we're, of course, all looking forward to, to hearing more about the youth, youth justice strategy, the new one as it develops. And um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ursula Kilkelly, Professor and Head of the College of Business and Law at the University College Cork. And she's also Chairperson of the Board of Management of Oberstown Children Detention Campus. campus. And Ursula's going to be speaking to us now about supporting children with disabilities in child detention. Thanks, Ursula. Great, thanks, uh, Karen. Um, afternoon, everybody. Really great to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, nicely following on from Daglon, I'm going to, to frame what I want to say in my, my few minutes um, with reference to the international uh, rights standards, the 
some of the research and data that we have on this issue and uh, talk a little bit about the Oberstein approach to, to children with disabilities and child attention and, and then conclude with some sort of key, key messages. And I, and I won't dwell too much on some of the preliminary remarks that I want to make because I know you'll have heard much about them as we've gone through the course of, of today. Um, the next slide then just, just I suppose contextualizes all of this importantly in the CRPD and uh, the reference to access to justice that we've been looking at um, today. The provision of procedural and age appropriate accommodation in all um, uh, and in all legal proceedings is, is called out. Also important is the reference to appropriate training, including specifically police and prison staff. And then Article 7, which we know requires the full enjoyment of children's rights, including the best interests and the right to be heard, um, including disability and age appropriate assistance to realise that right. And those concepts really frame the remarks I'll make in, in relation to the practice issues later on. On the next slide then, I just really draw attention to some of the, the provisions that Karen picked up on in her remarks at the outset as well. Uh, Article 37, calling out detention as a last resort. Article 40 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, referencing really extensive provision for children's rights and justice proceedings. And I think really critically, obviously, uh, the first reference to disability in international human rights law there in Article 2 of the CRC, the right to equal enjoyment of rights for children, uh, including the disability grant. And that becomes particularly important when we look at, at the setting of detention. Um, it's also important when we look at broader um, international standards around these issues to, to look to general comments of the, the committee, which in particular in a number of, of paragraphs of the most recent general comment here talks about a requirement of individual assessment of need and circumstances. So the children's rights standards actually call, call for an individual assessment of need. And that's something that we take very seriously in, in application of these principles. They also talk about an emphasis on training and inspection. And again, that's, that's critically important when we focus in on the issue of detention. On the next slide, I've just really drawn attention to the guidelines on child-friendly justice. Again, they'll be familiar to those of you who work in this field, um, but it's just to, to emphasize the application of children's rights in all of these settings in ways that are specific to individual children. I want to draw attention also to the, the, some of the research and data that does exist internationally on this issue. So the next slide, please. So here we have, I think, some of the high level messages that we found have come out of a uh, year long study that I've been undertaking with colleagues um, in, in UCC funded by the Irish Research Council and the uh, Department of Children and Youth Affairs, the Coalesce uh, strand of funding, uh, which really looked to identify international evidence uh, on youth justice for Ireland's uh, learning in the context of youth justice and, and the future strategy. Um, when we, I looked at what this told us about the topic we're discussing today, I came up with these sort of four general observations. Um, the first is a huge body of evidence that indicates that, that learning difficulties in particular can increase the chance of a child coming into conflict with the law. Um, that has already been referenced, I think, by Daglon. And what we see in this in particular is the school and school discipline policies playing a very particular role, um, as well as the labelling that children can experience in the school environment. Uh, in some respects, pushing children out of school, pushing them out of mainstream school, and really that having a very significant impact on, on how children then come into conflict with the law, get into trouble. So we see a very strong connection between not just children's uh, disabilities and learning difficulties, but how they are treated, how we respond to them in schools and the impact of that on their life chances. Uh, we also, through this study, undertook an analysis of the Growing Up in Ireland data, where in, in high level terms, we see learning difficulties being positively associated with, with children in conflict with the law. So really, we're starting to see um, our own data uh, mirror that those those um, more established international um, pieces of evidence. The third thing that's well documented now too 
is that children with disabilities face additional obstacles navigating the justice system. Uh, there is now a widespread understanding of the challenges that children face in communicating in within these formalized settings and the capacity that the children um, often struggle with to understand and participate effectively in decision making. And, and this is really critical because a lack of understanding and, and, and an inability to communicate effectively and to be understood um, can have very significant impacts on how children experience justice. Um, and then finally, um, we know this, this emerging um, evidence around the barriers to communication is starting to prompt uh, more innovative and creative solutions, thankfully, than we've seen before. Um, it's particularly in relation to acute in relation to police questioning in the courtroom settings, but we're starting to see innovation uh, through people like Talking Trouble and others who work with speech and language therapies, work, work with communication uh, it, within these formal settings to really enable children to participate more effectively and understand and be understood in these processes that have such significant impacts on their on their lives. The next slide then talks a little bit about um, one of the um, most significant uh, developments we've had in international child detention and that's the launch and um, completion of the UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty, which was published in 2019, the first international study of its kind. And what's significant in the context of today's topic is that it has a dedicated chapter uh, to um, children with disabilities. So it, it focuses um, specifically on this issue as a key concern internationally. Um, these global studies have in the past had really dramatic impacts on the visibility that these issues um, experience internationally and on the momentum that can be built up around them to try and advocate for change and reform to resource um, reform as well. So it's very significant that we have in this global study a dedicated chapter on, on this issue. Um, four points that I pulled out, having reviewed the chapter most recently, the first is the this concept of detention being actually used as a means for children with disabilities to access the services and supports that they need. Uh, that's in, in a way specifically excluded by the Irish legislation, um, but it is a common occurrence that nonetheless, implicitly perhaps, uh, we use um, settings, residential and closed settings to ensure children, to enable children to access services and supports which they should, of course, be able to access in the community. The second thing this chapter talks about is the impact of stigma and the misconceptions uh, that so often lie at the heart uh, at the root of this problem. Uh, thirdly, we see disability specific forms of deprivation of liberty. And then finally, uh, no surprising uh, surprises to see that the heightened risk of harm, neglect and abuse uh, being a really critical issue globally in, in this area. So the next slide then, um, just contextualizes all of that, or looks to the, the Irish setting, and in particular um, reflects um, and the provisions of the Children Act that I think are most relevant. Um, as Dagon has said, we, we do have a progressive youth justice system with a welfare focus. That's an important starting point with a strong emphasis on diversion. But interestingly, even though we have this recognition of communication uh, and understanding as key concepts to children and for children, uh, references to, to disability are very rare. Um, and the only explicit reference I could find was in relation to, to the duty on, on Garda Síochána during police uh, custody or police questioning of children in section 55 of the Act, which requires uh, Gardaí to have due respect for children with specific reference to their vulnerability owing to uh, physical and mental disability. So uh, it's important that it's there, but it's, um, I think, it's perhaps surprising, disappointing that it isn't more uh, called out more explicitly. We do know, and you've heard this from Daglon already, know that disability is uh, a cross-cutting factor in the youth justice strategy and will uh, be uh, very clearly um, addressed in, in both principle and in the substantive detail of the strategy. The next uh, slide then talks about uh, some of the um, 
areas that we have looked at in, in Oberstan. So Oberstan is the national detention facility for children under 18 that are um, referred to, to uh, detention on detention or remand orders. Um, and we've been publishing data for the last three years now, doing a deep dive of the, the case files of those who come into detention um, in the first quarter of the year. And the 2019 data um, reflected very much the data we, we published in the two previous years. Um, there were 75 young people passed through the doors of Oberstown in that period. And our data shows us that 31 of those 75 young people had a mental health need. Uh, 23 uh, had already been involved in the child and adolescent mental health services. Uh, 43 uh, of the 75 had not engaged in, in sorry, that should be education uh, prior to admission. So we're very significant, reflecting the international evidence, very significant relationship between educational experience and the experience of detention. 17 of those had a diagnosed learning disability. And then when we broke that down, we saw of those 17, 10 were not engaging in education prior to admission. 12 were exhibiting challenging behavior and 14 had mental health needs. All, all of that pointing to a convergence of, of um, factors and, and a complexity of need, um, but which we see through it, um, the, the strand of disability, which I think is important. Um, so how we respond and how we approach this is set out a little bit on the next slide. I'm conscious of time, Karen, I'm getting there. Um, we, we have in the Oberstown approach a very now well-established model of care um, and, and reinforcing that we have a new children's rights policy framework so that our entire approach to the care of children uh, is based on children's rights and children's rights standards. Um, KEHOP is our model of care, um, which is uh, one which is based on the Children Act and identifies um, the areas of focus in relation to care, health, education, work and offending behaviour and preparation for leaving. And critically underpinning that is an acceptance of the importance of an individual assessment of need. So going back to the international standard that I flagged at the beginning, we take that very seriously in, in seeing each individual child, assessing their, their individual needs when they come in and then developing from that a personalized care plan and um, where we can put in the necessary development and behavior supports to, to try and ensure that the time that young person spends in detention is maximized. And you'll see just and I pulled out some of the really important ones, again, bearing in mind the particular context of, of the, uh, the needs of children with disabilities here. Uh, we have with the ACTS team dedicated speech and language therapy. Uh, psychology and the role of, of forensic child and adolescent mental health services on site. We have individualized relationships supported by key worker and social care environment. And we have a participation strategy uh, which aims to ensure that each child is supported to be involved and participate fully in individual in then the residential unit and in the campus decision making. At school also so critical to children uh, um, uh, across the board, we have individualized education plan and we have a very high um, ratio of staff to young people so that we are focused on their particular individual needs and circumstances. So all of these aim to pr pr um, propose an individualized approach uh, that will accommodate and, and respond to children's individual circumstances and needs, including, obviously, including their uh, disabilities. And so the final slide then just points to some of the key um, messages and key, key learning from, from all of this. The first is, as we know, that children with disabilities are overrepresented. We also know, in addition, that they have, when they come into the system, they have challenges navigating it and having their needs met. The evidence points to the need to have an individualized approach and to ensure that we put in place the basic supports to both avoid system contact and to meet the needs of children when they come in to the system. Uh, we clearly need greater visibility um, in the youth system and, and in detention more generally. And I think training and inspection, it could be a really important way of doing that, particularly uh, the inspection that HICWA undertakes annually of Oberstown could very usefully focus more, I think, on the area of disability. And then finally, a point about really how often do we hear 
um, generally about the children's perspective, but more specifically, how often do we hear about children with disabilities experiences of how, how they encountered the, the youth justice system and detention more specifically. So thanks very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ursula, um, for that very concise uh, steer through from international standards and principles through to practice on the ground at Overstown and the work you're doing to I suppose, promote and support the rights of children with disabilities in that, in that setting. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I'd just like to ask everybody attending uh, to feel free to submit questions for our speakers at, towards the end of the session. Um, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions um, and to deal with any questions you may have. So please do submit them if you have them um, using the Q&A function on what I think is the right hand side of your screen. Um, our next speaker uh, is Darren Conroy who is Programme Manager with Extern, and he's going to speak to us about fostering community inclusion for children with disabilities who are in or at the edge of the justice system. Darren, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, hi, my name is uh, Darren, and as uh, Karen's mentioned, I'm a Programme Manager with Extern. We're a charity that work across uh, the island of Ireland. And in Ireland, we operate a range of programmes that support young people and families at risk and with complex needs. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly look at how our programs foster community inclusion for young people in or at the edge of the justice system. I'll look at some of the concepts within the new uh, draft youth justice strategy, and specifically, I'll look at the bail supervision scheme as one model that supports some of the harder to reach and most at risk young people. So if I go to the next slide, please. I suppose to start uh, these two statements kind of underpin some of the key um, uh, concepts as to how we address issues involving young people in or at the edge of the justice system. Uh, the first being that it takes a village to raise a child. And I suppose a lot of us have different, uh, I've heard this before and would have a different understanding, um, but I suppose essentially the point being that communities and society as a whole have a role and responsibility um, in helping our young people to play an active part and a full part in their community and in society. Uh, I suppose the, the, the basic concept in the village looks after its young people because they are the future for the village. Um, and the second, uh, an ounce of prevention been better than a pound of cure. Um, I know Deglon and uh, uh, Ursula in both their presentations referenced the need that early intervention and prevention. And I suppose this is the, the, the key concept in this. Um, it has better outcomes for young people. It is cheaper in the long term. Um, and ultimately for society and the individuals leads to better uh, a better outcome. If we go to the, the next slide. So essentially the context in which uh, young people find themselves in both uh, Deglon's uh, introduction and key points through the, the draft you just strategy and also in the last presentation, um, some of the key components from our perspective would be that collaboration is, is crucial and it's very uh, clearly outlined in the youth justice strategy that uh, the need for collaboration, this idea that we harness support for young people and in young people's families and communities um, with a view to strengthen their capacity uh, to live free from, from crime and from harm. Um, a core element within that is the, the need for a holistic, a wraparound response to the needs of children uh, and young people at risk. So it's not just the, the issue that's brought them into conflict with the justice system. It's not the offence, it's, it's also what other needs present, what's going on that's led to this. Uh, engaging young people at risk before they enter the justice system. So again, early intervention, um, even the, the general youth services and the provision on a broad sense across, across the country that can identify young people um, who may be at risk of entering the system. And I think the point Ursula mentioned in her last, uh, towards the end of her presentation around young people's engagement with education, that's, that's a key risk factor where young people disengage from education. They're at a greater risk of engaging with the, the, the justice system. Um, I suppose that the last point and that the point around the access to other services and supports, there is 
it's it's critical that young people have access to uh, and are able to avail of the range of services and supports, and that could be the likes of CAMS or um, addiction services. But equally, I suppose the, the, the concern that there isn't a unified, universal access across the country. Um, not every area and every community has sufficient services or access to the services. Um, and while the goal across uh, better outcomes, brighter futures, the national strategy and within the youth justice strategy is that young people, regardless of where they live, have access to services. Um, I think a situation may still exist in some pockets where your air code defines your outcome. And that's something that we really are working very hard in the voluntary sector and I suppose within, as, as has been outlined within the, 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 the strategic uh, statutory and policy sector to try uh, overcome. If we go to the, the next slide, please. So our services as an organization, we operate a range of community-based services and programs that are designed to prevent young people escalating within the, the youth justice system. Um, in the earlier uh, presentation, there was a reference to kind of a, a hierarchy and this idea of um, the higher up the, the, the needs, uh, the, or the higher up the pyramid, the, the, the greater the needs. Um, so you'll see at the bottom, um, so to speak, we operate a, a small number of Garda Youth Diversion projects out of the, the 105. Um, we operate four of those uh, across the country. Um, we also have a range of intensive family support projects. Um, above that, we operate a, a pilot project, the Janus Justice Project, which uh, works intensively with a harder to reach cohort that are um, potentially beyond the, the scope and reach of the Garda Youth Diversion Project. And then there's the bail supervision scheme, which is the, the program just before uh, custody in Overstown. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about uh, the, the bail supervision scheme uh, in, in terms of how it works. Um, I suppose each of the programmes look to empower young people and families to affect real change in their lives and develop or re-establish community connections with the goal that we have sustainable um, interventions with young people and families. Uh, and the services are designed to be targeted and more intensive as the need increases. If we maybe move to the, the next slide at this point, which looks at the bail supervision scheme. Um, and I suppose the graphic just to the right, um, in, in simple terms, identifies where the young person is at the center um, with their family, their peers, the school, and the, the wider community um, around them. And the bail supervision scheme is essentially it uh, was a pilot program, it's since been extended. Uh, it was based in Dublin. It's now been extended to cover the Limerick area and the Cork area. And the scheme gives the court an option of bail with a therapeutic input as an alternative to remand. So rather than a young person potentially been remanded in, in uh, custody or remanded in detention in Oberstown, there is the option for this support package to be put in place and this program to be put in place. It uses um, the MST model, which is multi-systemic therapy. And this targets the known causes and risk factors for offending behaviors uh, through engagement with the young person's networks and the young person's systems. Um, it's a globally recognized evidence-based model and it's been in operation for over 30 years. Um, and I suppose it's, it has a proven track record of achieving positive outcomes for the young people by keeping them at home, in education, and specifically in relation to this program, out of trouble. If we move to the next slide, please. So how the program achieves change is through facilitating uh, family involvement in the treatment. So we work with the primary carer. Um, it empowers parents to address and meet the needs of their child, um, and it promotes a long-term maintenance within that. Um, the goal ultimately is that the, while at the start, uh, intervention can be very intensive and can be daily, over a period of engagement, the parent is skilled up and empowered to be able to work and address the needs of the young person. Um, and as a result, the, the intervention can be scaled down 
it reduces the support that's required as the parental capacity increases. And one of the assumptions of MST is that people should be able to live without formal services involved indefinitely. So there is a sense that in engaging with the programme, there is a beginning, a middle and, and an end that can be achieved. There's a strong focus on that sustainability. And this is where the, the, the community engagement, the, the wraparound, the holistic approach is crucial to its, its uh, long term success. Uh, strong community links and the staff engaging in those links are crucial to that. Um, if we move to the next slides. One of the, the things that came through both in the, the last two presentations was around the, the needs of young people and the complex nature. Um, and in terms of the young people that engage with uh, MST and in the MST pilot that took place in Dublin, uh, a lot of cases presented with complex social and emotional needs. Uh, two thirds of young people had reported substance misuse issues. 60% um, had reported mental health concern and a number of those would have engaged in the formal um, services through CAMS uh, and the likes of informal services then where they're accessing Jigsaw and other supports. 58% of caregivers themselves reported mental health or addiction issues and I suppose the, in, indicating that the generational impact of crime, 88% of cases had a family member involved uh, with crime. What these figures and what these uh, profiles highlight is that the, the complex nature of higher risk cases, um, often with generational issues for the family, um, many young people with a mental health or educational need can face difficulties and delays with diagnosis. And that delay can impact their support and the appropriate interventions for that young person. I think particularly when we look at education, one of the goals of the programme and uh, throughout all our programmes is reconnecting young people back to education, be it mainstream or training, uh, training programmes, but identifying how education and how the young person can be re supported to reintegrate back into education, um, because there's a hugely preventative and protective factor in a young person's life. Go to the second last slide, I think. Be glad to hear, keep on track with time. Um, so our services and community inclusion, I suppose some points that we would feel are critical to the success of any intervention is that it's holistic. It works with the whole ecology of the child and the family. It's there to improve and develop social networks within the wider community. So the program isn't just you've got the young person takes part in the program it's embedded in where the young person is and what supports they can sustain themselves and their family uh, the support and where they're supported and maintained engagement in education and in some instances it starts the provision of that one good adult that allows them to build connections with others that can be sustained so somebody that will look out for somebody that they can talk to um, and can address some of the concerns and issues they have it addresses offending behaviour and it balances rights with responsibilities. Um, and that's, that's a common theme that, that young people um, can often understand they have rights, but the responsibilities with those rights is a piece that needs to be uh, explored with them. And ultimately, the goal being that there's a sustainable integration and reintegration within the community. I suppose a link to place, a sense of place and belonging or a sense of community are all strong drivers in building connectedness, in building resilience and grounding young people with a sense of ownership and with belonging. And I suppose fostering a sense of purpose and a sense of hope for a future. They're strong drivers in preventing young people becoming disengaged or disaffected or disassociated and therefore more open to negative criminal uh, influences and criminal activity. And so, conscious of time, I'll wrap up with that. Um, and if there's any further questions, be happy to, to take them. Thanks very much. Sarah, thanks very much indeed. And as ever for keeping to time, we really appreciate it. Um, we have just over 10 minutes for questions. And um, so if there are those of you attending who still have a question that you might like to ask, please submit it and we'd love to hear it. Um, but I have a question here, which I think, if I may, may put to, to Ursula and Daylon and Darren, if that's okay. It's a question from Donica. 
um, and he's asking what is a difficult question when we you know I, I'm conscious in our own work we depending on a piece of work we're doing we think about children in very specific circumstances and by virtue of thinking about them in one way we don't always think about them in another um, and that presents its own challenges the question from Donica is how do we best address the intersecting issues which may uniquely face certain children in contact with the youth justice system especially in terms of prevention and diversion and he specifically references traveler and migrant children with mental health issues or disabilities um, so can I open it up to one of you to offer some observations on that around the challenges I assume around that. Happy to jump in. Thanks, Siglo. Um, and it's not an easy question. Um, one of the, the, the things we'll be doing in the youth justice strategy is expanding um, the Garda Youth Diversion Project offering. Um, and I didn't mention uh, the very, uh, in my presentation move within that, we're looking at rebranding the projects uh, there's a view, even from within on Garda Siakana, that the word Garda is stigmatising and rebranded as something else. And expanding the offering in terms of early intervention, family support, and also working with Harder to engage uh, young children. And Harder to engage can mean deeply involved in crime and antisocial behaviour, or hardly hard to engage for cultural reasons, and so they're not the same. Um, we already have one project um, that focuses on migrants, particularly migrants uh, of African origin. We're looking at, it's in the greater Dublin area. We're looking at extending that to other areas of Dublin. We're in negotiation with the Gardaí uh, and one of the projects in the inner city um, to recruit a dedicated worker who will work with the Roma community uh, in the city. Um, and then in terms of travellers, some of the projects work with travellers, some find it very difficult, again, reaching into that community and, and travellers not wanting to be involved. So the revised and expanded GYDP offering will, will focus very much um, on travellers. But there's two other elements, if I can, if I can go on a little bit uh, in terms of, of the answer. Um, and one is about links locally and a structure locally to make sure that <clears throat> children are responded or are, are referred to the appropriate service. And that's something many of our Garda Youth Diversity projects do. Occasionally when I ask as part of my checklist when I'm meeting them, do you link in with, with whoever it is and, and do you have referral pathways? The answer is yes, we do when those services exist. Uh, and mental health is a particular one that's under pressure. So th there's a real issue there in terms of uh, how you respond um, I think the point was made in Darren's presentation, how you respond when the service is, 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 on, is stretched uh, on the ground. And then so the final bit of the answer is, in terms of the youth justice strategy, making sure that that, that, that question of, of um, an integrated approach locally and, and making sure that people are referred to the, po the appropriate agency and there's smooth transitions where that's appropriate. But that is somebody's responsibility. And um, we're looking at the child and family support networks at sub county level on the basis that the, the SIPSIs have a role at county level of coordination, but that the county is usually too big for sort of integrated case management. Uh, so the youth justice strategy, I think, will point in that direction as the solution, but it's the new Department of Children and Youth Affairs uh, and Bob F will have to finalize some of that detail. And then the final bit, and I'm going on a little bit, but the final bit is. If you think of all the services that, that, that are there for children in difficulty, you've mainstream youth services, you've Tusla child and family services, you've mental health, you have drugs. So those are three big circles in a Venn diagram uh, and they overlap to a certain extent. And somewhere in there, there's the bit that the criminal justice system is responsible for. Uh, and there's a decision to be made about the tension between keeping that as small as possible, recognizing that it's not appropriate to have children involved in the criminal justice system, except as a last resort, but also recognizing that uh, very often it's only the criminal justice system and the guards as a frontline service um, who can see the human damage that has been done. Uh, and it's, 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 it's to the courts and the prisons and detention and the guards that, that the financial costs uh, of the lack of earlier services and interventions. So there's a tension between keeping the bit we do quite small 
and actually making sure that it responds to the needs of, of, of young children in difficulty and their families. Um, and we're taking the approach that we'll do whatever is required, accepting that other agencies may not do it. And, and we manage that by having the Garda Youth Diversion Projects at arm's length from the guards, but also building those local links, uh, which doesn't actually address the question of what you do when there are no services. But Thanks, Daglon. Ursula or Darren, would you like to comment? Just, I'll just say a couple of a couple of things very, very quickly, because Daglon has covered a huge amount of ground mm -hmm. there. I mean, I think one of the things that Daglon didn't actually mention, which is really critical and groundbreaking potentially about the youth justice strategy, is that it actually calls out the importance of the children first model. So it, it's establishing as a, as a principle that we treat children in the justice system as children first. And I think that's the answer to the complicated question about whether they are traveler children, whether they are migrant children, or whether they have disabilities or not. They are children and we must assess their needs individually. And all of the research points to that approach, as does all of the children's rights uh, literature and standards. So the children first model actually is really core to all of this. And I think, yes, the, the issue of what services are there is always going to be a, um, a, a difficult one. But I think it's really critical that we're recognising that now as, a, as an issue of policy and framing it within the Better Outcomes, Brighter Futures framework is absolutely critical as well to, to the continuation of that philosophy, really. And just to Michelle, Michelle Martin's point about the Children Act is being reviewed. I think uh, Devon might say something about that, but, but it is um, under review. And I think there is an opportunity in the strategy as well to pick up on some of the areas where we need to, to continue to evolve um, our approaches. Sorry, Karen. No, I think uh, to be fair, I think Deadlon has given a very brief or a very detailed uh, kind of run through. I think Ursula's point ultimately, the fact we need to look at the young person and the needs rather than maybe the, the label um, uh, or, you know, or, the, or the category that's attached to it, because ultimately the needs and the issues are what we need to, to get to and deal with rather than, um, you know, and, and, and for that young person, because, you know, the young person um, ultimately could appear to be in a very, uh, you know, a very um, middle class, middle of the road, everything, but their needs could be such that they need a particular intervention, whereas a young person who's coming from another background could have no issues and no needs. So I think we've got to look at the individual and, and assess it and, and, and the services. I think um, th there's always going to be this challenge around the, the range of services being in position and, and, and available where they're needed. Um, we're quite a, a dispersely spread population. You know, it's a small population on a relatively large island for the size of, of population. And that's always going to be a challenge. And I think some of the services are, um, and, and certainly in terms of the, the, the youth justice services are very much about ensuring that no young person gets left behind. And I think that's been touched on by both within the strategy itself and, and in Deglon's presentation. And I know Ursula's, uh, Ursula's reference to that. I think that's going to be crucial that essentially, regardless of the background, regardless of the issue that young people aren't left behind in this. Karen, you're, actually your, your sound is very garbled. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I, I look by the look at Darren's face, he yeah, can't understand you either. So. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> you sound Sorry, like you're Karen. underwater. <laughs> No, Karen, I'm afraid your audio isn't any better. No, not any better at all. And then let me let me just put something in our chat. Would you like, would you like to take the last questions? questions? I, I might I might deal with the while you're figuring out the audio, I might deal with the question about the publication of the youth justice strategy. Um it, it was published in June in draft. We did run a consultation process over a period of, of almost two years, uh, and that included consulting with children. Um, it was published in draft and after a consultation process, and we're running, uh, we've 
effectively finished for the consultation process uh, on, on the draft. Um, there's still an opportunity if, if the person who asked the question is interested in having an input um, to, to talk to myself or to make the submission. Uh, and then we aim to um, finalize revised text and submit it to government and have it published before the end of the year. No, unfortunately, we no. can't, Karen. Can I, can I just make a further point, actually, just to, to dive on, just following on from that, and just to say that actually Oberstan is in, in also in a strategic planning process, um, and there will be opportunity for stakeholder involvement in that process to um, both generally, but also I think to this forum, I think if there are if there are people with specific um, interests and concerns about children with disabilities in the, in the detention system, it would be really good to hear from you. Um, because it isn't a subject that has sufficient visibility in its own right in, in our strategy, um, apart from, as I mentioned, the individualised approach that we take. So really good to maybe look out for that and contact me if, if it's something you're interested in being involved in. The, all the usual, usual suspects will be involved anyway, but if, you're, if you haven't been involved before and you, you come to this new, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Now, Karen. Okay, that sorry about this. I'm not supposed to be a barrier to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just so I don't know if you if you already dealt with the questions that came up there in the chat box whilst I disappeared. We did. Okay, we did. super, super. Well, I just see we've reached uh, four o'clock. Um, so just without further ado, I just want to say sincere thanks on behalf of the NDA, obviously in particular, to Ursula and Daglon and Darren for for sharing your wisdom and your plans with us today um, and what is a very important um, and challenging area as well and for what it's worth I'd concur with the whole idea that a starting point to deal navigate the complexity is um, seeing children as children first and and and, and using that lens um, uh, to embark on trying to arrive at um, appropriate child rights based solutions. Um, also just a big thank you to all of the attendees at this session and um, this is the conclusion to the conference uh, as you know there's no plenary after this so the NDA has asked me to thank you all very much for your attendance and participation at the conference and the presentations and so on will be available as you know on the NDA's website if you want to follow up so without further ado thanks very much to everybody and uh, take care bye 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 bye